Okay, so for general deterrence, the idea was that punishing offenders would send a message to everybody else. So focus deterrence, operations, ceasefire, that sort of stuff. The idea is you punish the gang that shoots the first person. And you're not trying to deter that gang anymore. You're really focused on every other gang and them seeing what happens and, and they're changing their calculus and stop committing crime. So in general deterrence, you, you punish offenders to send a message to everybody else. Specific deterrence is the idea that maybe punishing those offenders will have an effect on, on those particular offenders. So does punishing people, does amping up the severity of punishment reduce their chance of committing crime in the future? The ideal study would be, you know, something about comparing a prison sanction to a probation sanction. But in, in reality, those are sort of two different sorts of critters. The kind of people that get probation are very different from the kind of people that get prison. And so we really can't do that sort of study. What we've done is compare kind of similar sanctions, but ones that are more punitive. Um, so what happens if somebody gets a boot camp uh, instead of, uh, probation or, or intensive probation versus regular probation or what happens when we make prisons as in the Sheriff Joe example more painful than they were uh, so boot camps well that was really a, a sort of child of the, the 1980s and the get tough movement and, and the idea that we need to make punishments meaner um, and the idea was that you, you sort of recreate a military boot camp you send usually juveniles into this short-term um, really hardcore, a lot of physical exercise, discipline, uh, and mostly it was supposed to be deterrence. It was supposed to make the experience so painful that they wouldn't want to go back. Um, we know from dozens and dozens of experiments that most boot camps really didn't change behavior compared to whatever the, the other sanction was in the study. Uh, most of the studies found it didn't really matter. The few that found boot camps mattered cut both ways, almost in half. There's a handful of studies that found that boot camps did work, and there's a handful that found that they actually made people worse. Uh, and so the real kind of rub is, like, what kind of boot camp did what? And, and the findings, when you look at that data, suggest that the boot camps that tended to work were ones that had a really strong rehabilitation component and good sort of aftercare, which means like once they get out of the boot camp, you, you sort of follow through with probation and structure and so on and so forth. That being the case, it's, it's like it's pretty clear that it's not the deterrent part of it that works. It's that you, you had to kind of mold it into a more rehabilitative program to make it work. Um, so boot camps as deterrents were kind of a dud. As was something called intensive supervision probation. And here the idea was to take regular probation. And your probation is, you know, you might get a two-year prison sentence, and we suspend that and let you out in the community, and you have to meet with a probation officer. Um, and you may have certain conditions, can't drink, have to do drug tests. And so the idea was to sort of change the nature of probation and make it meaner and leaner. Up the drug test, up the supervision components. Um, give probation officers, instead of 50 people to supervise, like 15 people to supervise so they could really crack down. Um, and, and so, again, kind of in the, in the spirit of the deterrence of the 1980s and, and early 90s, um, we embraced what people call tongue-in-cheek the PM and CM model, that you collect a lot of urine for drug tests and, and supervise the hell out of them, but don't really provide a lot of rehabilitation opportunities. Again, we have really good research on this, and the research suggests that um, this model had no effect on crime whatsoever, that people in the ISP programs tended to get locked up a little bit more because they'd fail more drug tests because they would have technical violations, but it had no effect on um, arrest for new crimes. Uh, and so, again, not for, for deterrence, kind of another dud. Um, and again, like boot camps, you, what we learned is that you can kind of make these critters work, but you have to make them sort of rehabilitative in nature, that you have to move to a human service model as opposed to a deterrent model. Another piece of evidence comes from the domestic violence study that I, I talked about a bit in the intro to this course, um, and, and the sort of importance of replication. Um, the idea is that, that arrest in and of itself police arresting somebody can, can act as a deterrent. It's painful. Most, most people experience it as bad. Um, 
and, and so they did this study with domestic violence and police responding to a domestic violence scene literally pulled out a card that was randomly shuffled that said arrest counselor separate and so the arrest card if there's any evidence of physical violence they arrested the perpetrator counsel was they did their best to sort of mediate the dispute separate was they told the a perpetrator usually the male hey take a walk if you come back here within eight hours we're going to arrest you um and initially the findings were very supportive the one done in minneapolis unfortunately none of the follow-ups sort of replicated what was done in minneapolis that um, in Milwaukee and Oregon and other sites, uh, either it didn't work or, or arrest actually sort of escalated the situation. Um, and, and so arrest in and of itself then, for the most part, isn't a very strong specific deterrent. Um, I don't know how many of you heard about Sheriff Joe. He usually makes the email rounds uh, once or twice a year. My relatives send me emails about, look at this, this is what we should do. Um, he, he started out with kind of the they needed funding for a new jail in Arizona, and rather than build a jail, he created a tent city. Uh, so out in the desert, put up a bunch of old army tents, uh, and made that into a jail. And then he kind of just kept getting sort of more and more into it. Uh, picture you here, see inmates having to wear pink shirts and pink underwear, and German shepherds with cameras on their head patrolling it, and eating only cold bologna sandwiches, and on and on and on. And his idea is, like, prison should be so bad that nobody will want to be come back again. That is specific deterrence, right? If they go to my prison, the Sheriff Joe prison, uh, they're never going to commit crime again. Uh, and so he was so confident in, in his methodology that he commissioned a study. Um, and basically what they found is that, well, let's compare inmate or Sheriff Joe's inmates with Sheriff, whoever it was before him, inmates. And if he's right, his inmates should be doing better than what had been done. And what they found was that it didn't matter a bit that, it didn't matter whether the inmates in, <laughs> were in a tent and wore pink underwear versus being in an old jail and getting hot meals. That, and, I mean, common sense should kind of tell you that the, the pain, most painful part about being locked up is being locked up. That, you know, only bologna sandwiches might make it a bit worse, but that the fact that you can't leave and you can't see your family and you can't do other stuff is what really makes it sort of painful. Uh, so... When you get the email that says, hey, Sheriff Joe does all this stuff and it works, um, like other stuff, be skeptical. The one sort of ray of hope for all the specific deterrent stuff is a new one. This is a, this is a research study that was done in the last few years. Uh, it's called Project Hope. Uh, great acronym. If you're going to do a program, key number one is come up with a great acronym. HOPE stands for uh, Hawaii's Opportunity Probation with Enforcement. And it's kind of a riff off of what David Kennedy did with the ceasefire stuff. The judge gives uh, probationers this explicit warning, like, hey, this is different than any probation you've done before. If you fail the drug test, you will go to jail. And, and basically, for the first failed drug test, they may get a day or two in jail. Next failed drug test, they just keep ratcheting up week, month in jail. Um, and, and it's sort of the opposite of a, a, a treatment model in that unless the offender wants drug treatment, they're not going to get it. Um, so they're going to just get thrown in the hopper and drug tested. And, and the idea is well, there's a lot of offenders out there that just with the threat of drug tests in jails will stop using illicit drugs. Um, and the initial research on this was really positive. Uh, so what they found was that people in hope, I suppose, people who were randomly assigned to kind of the usual way of doing things were a lot less likely to use illicit drugs, a lot less likely to fail drug tests, um, and on and on. Uh, and so... People, like, like everything else, um, people in the corrections community are just all ramped up about this now. And the idea is, well, we can apply this to everything. It doesn't have to be just drug and alcohol offenders. The problem is this, this sort of model revolves around being able to have an independent test of whether people are violating the conditions of probation. So you have to have a P-test. Um, and, and, and the issue is there's no P-test for a burglar or for a rape or for other crimes that... that what do we do with people who are offenders but not drug offenders or alcohol offenders? Uh, so it's kind of promising in the sense that it, it seems to have worked, um, but we're sort of unsure right now about how well it can be replicated, how well it's going to work in the future, how, well, how hard it is to maintain, that sort of stuff. So literally this is like last couple of years sorts of research. Um, and it's part of the Kennedy stuff and the HOPE stuff. It's all part of this sort of the new what people are calling swift, certain, and fair model. And the fair is sort of a recognition. It used to be swift, certain, severe. 
the fair is sort of this recognition that severity seems to be the least important part of the equation, and so that if we focus all our energy on swift and certain, we don't have to send people to prison for as long a time. We don't have to use those resources. Um, so NIJ did a, a, a National Institute of Justice put out as, as brief in 2014 kind of saying, well, what do we know about everything related to deterrence? What have we learned in 30, 40 years of research? Um, and hopefully you got most of what's on here from what I've been talking about. The biggest thing that, that we've learned is that certainty matters a lot more than um, severity of punishment. Um, and, and to be fair, uh, Beccaria and Bentham and those early philosophers that, that created this thing basically said as much without any data. Um, just philosophizing about it um, made the same point, and it turns out that they were right. Um, the other thing on here is, is that the death penalty and other punishments don't seem to deter people. Um, what does work is convincing people that the odds that they're going to get caught are going up. And that's the police part. That's this first part right here. Um, and the two, four, and five are all sort of the idea that severity doesn't matter. Uh, which is ironic because for a long time our first inclination was to, you know, we think something's a problem, we ramp up the punishment. The reason is probably because it's easy to do, right? To, to change the punishment, what do you have to do? You change a law that says, for this crime, you go to prison for two more years. It's a lot harder to up the certainty, right? That's been the more creative sort of David Kennedy stuff, putting more police on the street stuff, changing how we use police. Um, so we have gotten a lot more creative in, in that sense. Um, so there's a fair amount of negative or null research on, on deterrence, and it, it sort of it, it tends to surprise a lot of students. And so I want to point out a, a few things. One is that that for some crimes, deterrence theory probably is pretty limited. So this works if people are rational and they're thinking about the consequences of their action. Uh, if they are not, if they are impulsive, if they're not thinking about uh, the consequences, it's probably not going to work. And for a lot of crimes, um, the rationality assumption uh, doesn't really bear out. Second is that you know we, we are, we're operating in a democratic society, so that there are limits to what we can do in terms of certainty uh, and swiftness, right? That uh, one of my old professors from Texas used to point out that, that China was able to almost eliminate for a while the uh, people using opium. And they did it by authorizing police officers to shoot anybody on the spot who got caught selling or using opium. Now, <laughs> do we want to live in a world where police officers have that authority? Probably not. but. Um, in theory, then, you know, you could make deterrence sort of meaner and you could make it work perhaps a little better uh, in a non-democratic society. And finally, there's, again, the issue of marginal versus absolute that you keep in mind we're talking about, you know, what happens when we ratchet up or down swiftness, severity, uh, certainty. In terms of policy implications, so every theory generates some policy implication. Uh, the deterrence one is sort of built into the actual theory, so it's kind of a duh, you know, common sense. But the implication of this theory is that, you know, if the theory is right, what should reduce crime is swift, certain, severe punishment. Um, and the corollary is that rehabilitation isn't going to work because there's sort of nothing to change. There's nothing to fix. There's nothing wrong with people. They're making a kind of rational calculation about the best way to achieve their goals. And worse... If rehabilitation kind of gives people something, you're rewarding crime and sending the wrong message. So um, the gist of the theory is, the, the policy implication is that punishment should be swift, certain, and if not severe, at least severe enough to work. Um, the last point is that, you know, folks that, that tend to bind this model have also said, look, if you, if you can't be swift, certain, or severe enough, or if people, there, there's some people that are not rational, then their argument is the only thing left to us is to sort of take away their opportunity to offend. And there's kind of two ways to do that. The American model is something called incapacitation. Uh, and that is largely by locking people up in prison, uh, we take away their chance to uh, victimize people. And, and so the idea, and this is what's seductive about it, it's very simple, right? There's no you don't have a big program manual for how to do this. You just take offenders and you put them in prison and keep them there as long as you can. Um, 
So a famous Wall Street Journal columnist basically explained it by saying, everybody can understand that a thug in prison can't shoot your sister. Um, so it's easy. We have the technology. We're, we're pretty good now at building prisons and keeping people inside. Um, and, and, and common sense tells you that if you lock up enough people, you're going to have some impact on crime. The issue is, like, how well, what crime, and those sorts of things. Um, and so we've sort of tried to figure that out in the 80s and 90s when we were building a bunch of prisons. We were also doing research to see how well it worked. Um, and you can do that a variety of ways. You, you can sort of um, project what crime should have been if you didn't lock people up and compare it to what it was when you did lock people up. You can look at states that were forced to release inmates and say, all right, does crime go up when states release inmates and so on and so forth. Um, in the book, there's a little capsule about incapacitation and all the research. If you want the details, that's a good place to look. Um, what we know is that it works best for high rate offenses, like burglary, robbery, and theft. And almost not at all, if at all, for homicide. And the reason is pretty simple, that, that if you lock up a high rate offender, you know, how many robberies could that person have committed in a day or week or month? Tons, right? So locking them up is going to put a dent in crime. But if you think about something like murder, right? how many homicides does the typical murderer commit in their whole life? One, right? So locking that person up probably is not going to prevent another homicide because it's such a rare event. Um, so our best guesstimates are that um, there's a classic research study that, that showed that when California locked up, doubled the you know, California and other states. When we went from 400,000 inmates to 800,000 inmates back in the 80s, late 80s, we doubled our prison population, and in that decade, we reduced robbery by essentially 18%. So does it work? Sure. Robbery is a pretty serious crime as well. I mean, nobody wants to get mugged. Uh-oh, I better finish up. Uh, so it can work uh, for some crimes. The issue is it's sort of least effective for uh, low-rate uh, relatively rare crimes. And those are the crimes, unfortunately, that we're most afraid of. Right? Americans fear rape and homicide above everything else, and, and the crimes for which incapacitation is least effective. There's also other issues. We're, we're grappling with this now. You hear it in the news over and over again. We've kind of over-incarcerated. We've gotten to the point where we're not getting a, as big a bang for our buck. So when we doubled the population back in the 80s and we got 18% reduction in robbery, every time you do that, you're going to get less and less of an effect. And the reason is straightforward, that you know, if we're always locking up people, the people that are left over get less and less and less serious. Right? So we swoop in and we lock up a lot more people, who's left over? Right? The next time we swoop in, it's going to be lower rate offenders, and we're going to keep losing our, our sort of effectiveness. Um, and if nothing good happens in prison and these people get released, um, they can actually turn out to be counter uh, to be uh, counterproductive uh, over the long haul. That is, that uh, over 10, 15, 20 year period, uh, we might lose not only lose our, our, our crime reduction, we might actually start contributing to the crime problem. Um, all right, so that's the end of the deterrence section. Next section is going to be um, the sort of flip side of deterrence, which is, is rational choice.